For today's video, we have gotten our hands on the all new 2018 Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. This is the first new Mitsubishi in America in quite some time. Mitsubishi's crossover lineup in America is a little bit confusing at this point. We have the Outlander Sport at the bottom end of things. That is a subcompact crossover designed to compete with things like the Mazda CX-3. And then at the top end, we have the Mitsubishi Outlander, which is a little bit larger than a RAV4 or CRV because it has an available third row in the back. Nestled right between those two vehicles, we have this new Eclipse Cross. Mitsubishi designed the Eclipse Cross to be the stylish alternative to something like the RAV4 or the Tucson, and they have priced this very much like the average compact crossover in America, starting at $23,295. I have to say that I actually like the looks of this crossover. I like the wedge shape up front, I like the chrome bits going on right here, and I think that the overall look is actually quite attractive. Halogen headlamps are standard, but LED headlamps are available. You'll find those on the top end trim. Because Mitsubishi already has the Outlander Sport and the Outlander bookending the Eclipse Cross in terms of overall size, they decided to go a slightly different direction with this vehicle in terms of its overall styling. You can really see that right back there with that rear door and the rear end. They're calling this sort of a coupe-like styling theme, very similar to what we see with BMW's X2 and their X6, although obviously not quite as aggressive as those BMW models. In terms of overall size, this is 173.4 inches long, making it a little bit on the short side for the compact category. It's about three inches shorter even than the Sportage or the Tucson, about seven inches shorter than the Honda CRV. But again, keep in mind that this is priced more like the Tucson or Sportage and not like the Hyundai Kona or Mazda CX-3, which are in the subcompact category. So you could think of this sort of as a tweener vehicle because this is about five inches longer than the Mazda CX-3 and about four inches longer than the Honda HR-V, which is quite long for its smaller segment. Taking a closer look at the back, you'll notice that versus most of the compact crossovers in America, we have a relatively horizontal rear window and everything is getting pinched as it goes rearward. And then we have what kind of appears like a very small trunk back here, but the overall shape is still definitely crossover-like. Moving around to the back, I see a combination of things going on. I actually see a little bit of Volvo back here, perhaps a little bit of Pontiac Aztec, and a little bit of Mitsubishi. Now, I actually think this is an attractive crossover, but be sure to let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below, because everybody else in my office thinks that I'm crazy and that this is not a very attractive vehicle, but I'd love to know what you think about it down there. Now, I'm not saying this is the most attractive compact crossover in America, but I actually value the fact that Mitsubishi decided to go in a different styling direction than everybody else, and this is definitely not boring. In the United States, we find just one engine under this hood. It's a 1.5 liter turbocharged direct injection engine. It produces 152 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque. If that sounds familiar to you, you're probably thinking of the Honda CRV, which also uses a 1.5 liter turbo. And like the Honda, this is mated only to a continuously variable transmission. The base model is available as either a front wheel drive or an all wheel drive vehicle, but all the other trims of the Eclipse Cross come standard with all wheel drive. If you get that base model with front wheel drive, your fuel economy average should come in at 27 miles per gallon combined. All the other trims should get 25. Front seat comfort is fairly average in base and mid-level trims, although it is worth noting that the SE model that we're driving, which does come in at $27,000, does not have a power driver's seat, nor does it have any adjustable lumbar support. The model that we're driving also does not have a moonroof, so headroom is quite generous. I still have about two inches left. Moving to the rear seats, you'll definitely notice that this is smaller overall than the Honda CRV. We have about five inches less combined legroom. That's front row plus second row. We also have a decent amount less headroom. In fact, the rear end of this vehicle is actually more similar to something like the Nissan Rogue Sport, which is one category below this. At 37.3 inches of headroom, this is notably below the RAV4 or CRV. Now, if I sit slightly inboard and upright, my hair is brushing the ceiling, but my head doesn't touch the ceiling. But this sill right here is definitely in the way, and it is pretty easy to bop your head on that. The rear seat is definitely more comfortable than something like a Mazda CX-3, but it's not as roomy or as comfortable as the next size category up. If I sit in this middle seat, my head is definitely touching the ceiling, however, because it is higher off the ground than the outboard seating positions. Because of the overall shape of the Eclipse Cross, Mitsubishi did have to put these headrests fairly low on the seats. And that means that they may hit some people in kind of an unusual position on the back. Although for me at six feet tall, they're almost right. They are just a little bit low, but actually that probably would be okay. Now the rear seats do feature a recline function, 
this is the most upright position. There's actually a position that's even more reclined than my initial seating position right there. If I'm sitting in this position, my hair is definitely brushing the ceiling. I have about a quarter inch of headroom left. But if I scoot all the way over to this side, back to where I started, then I can't actually lean all the way back without craning my head to one side because of the way the overall ceiling is shaped. My head is definitely touching the ceiling there. The downside to the aggressive styling that we find in the Eclipse Cross is cargo capacity because you'll only find 22.6 cubic feet of storage space behind this hatch. That's about 18 cubic feet less than you'll find in the Rogue, the CRV, or the RAV4. In fact, because of this overall styling choice, we actually don't find more room than something like the Honda HRV. The Honda HRV actually beats this by about one cubic foot. That means that in our 24 inch roller bag test, we were only able to fit four of those 24 inch roller bags back here, and that was only when these rear seats were in their most upright and least comfortable position. Going in for a closer look, if we lift up the load floor, we do find a temporary spare tire and some small additional storage areas on either side. As we look around this interior, keep in mind that we are in the SE trim. Up front, we find height adjustable shoulder belts and two-way adjustable headrests. The seats in our model are fabric. We have kind of an interesting diamond pattern there in the center insert. You can see that we have fairly aggressive bolstering on the seat side cushion and bottom cushion. If we move on over to the doors, we find a decent portion of soft touch materials. We have a soft touch injection molded upper section, a fabric insert right there for the middle of the door, soft armrest, and then hard plastics lower on the door, just as you'd expect in this category. The front of the door has a fairly large bottle holder. You could pretty easily put some large two liter bottles right there in that door pocket. Well, we're looking at the passenger side. Something that passengers asked me to point out this week is that we actually find a bulge in the footwell right there on the passenger side only. It doesn't exist on the driver's side. It's my understanding that that bump in the footwell is because of the way the exhaust system is designed in this vehicle. Moving from the doors on over to the dashboard, we find basically the same combination of materials. We find a soft touch injection molded upper section of the dashboard, some imitation metal trim below that, and then a fairly large bin style glove compartment on the passenger side. I was able to fit a larger iPad in there, and then we have an additional storage slot above that where you can keep your instruction manual. Plastics lower on the dashboard are hard, pretty much as you'd find in every entry. Plastics on the upper portion of the dashboard are soft. If I move on over to the center of the dashboard, we find a standard seven inch color touchscreen infotainment system. The key thing to know about this is that although the seven inch screen is standard, smartphone integration like Apple CarPlay is not standard. This is actually an option. The system is fairly easy to interact with. It's positioned very much like Mazda's infotainment screen. However, unlike the Mazda system, you can actually touch this while you're driving. That makes interacting with CarPlay an awful lot easier. If we zoom out from there, you'll notice it's definitely perched on the dashboard, sort of like an integrated tablet computer. Below that, we have two large air vents right there. And then continuing down, we find the dual zone automatic climate control system. Below the climate control, we find an eco button, two USB ports that integrate with that touchscreen infotainment system, 12 volt power port right there, a fairly small storage cubby. You can see I'm not quite able to fit my iPhone 7 Plus in there with the cable attached. We then find the controls for the heated seats, high and low control for the all-wheel drive system. This basically just changes the modes between auto, snow, and gravel. There is no enable, disable button for this particular system. And then to the left of that, we have a pretty standard console shifter. Drive is all the way back. If you want the manual mode, we pull to the left. We push away from the driver for up, pull towards the driver for gear change down. And then to the right of that, we find the touch controller for that infotainment system. This is kind of an interesting way of interacting with the system. It operates very much like the Lexus system, although I think the software in this vehicle is actually better designed than what we see in modern Lexus models. It still takes more time with your eyes off the road to interact with some of the interfaces, especially Apple CarPlay, using this touchpad right here. But that wasn't really an issue for me because you can, of course, touch the screen. And again, is one of the things I really like about this. You can either use this input method or you can just touch the screen. Personally, I think touching the screen is easier, although it is nice to have direct access buttons down here in easy reach for apps, audio, the home page, and a back button. Continuing behind that, we find two large cup holders right here, the electric parking brake and auto brake hold. And then between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest, which opens to reveal a fairly large storage cubby. We have a small divider right here where you can put pens or pencils, that sort of thing. And you can see it is actually quite a nice sized storage compartment. The instrument cluster features a fairly traditional design. We have two large analog gauges and then a color multifunction display in between. The multifunction display is where we find things like our trip computer information, distance to empty, economy, 
uh, trip mileage A and B, and a few vehicle settings as well. You can also see the status of the all-wheel drive system, and then there's some permanent digital gauges at the bottom for engine temperature and fuel level. The steering wheel features a three-spoke design. We have a large spoke at the bottom, and then the plastic trim from that spoke continues up each side. On the left side of the wheel, we have the infotainment buttons, track forward, backward, volume up, down, mode, etc., voice command, and dedicated phone buttons. And then on the right side of the wheel, we find the buttons for the cruise control system. Radar adaptive cruise control is optional, but we don't find it in the model that we're driving. Although the Eclipse Cross looks the part of a sporty crossover, things actually start to fall apart a little bit when you get this out on the road. In our acceleration testing, this model ran from 0 to 60 in 8.9 seconds, even though we have that 1.5 liter turbocharged engine under the hood and the continuously variable transmission. That combination, 1.5 turbo and CVT, allowed the Honda CRV to go from 0 to 60 considerably faster than this model, 7.3 seconds, even though that engine doesn't appear to produce necessarily that much more power than this engine. Personally, I think that's because Honda is underrating their 1.5 liter turbo. I think it produces a little bit more power than they're saying, but I think a lot of it also has to do with the way the continuously variable transmissions in this vehicle and in that vehicle work. This vehicle's CVT does not change ratios quite as quickly as the transmission that we see in the Honda CRV, and the ratio spread, which is the difference between the highest ratio and the lowest ratio, does not seem to be quite as broad, and that does affect the acceleration out on the road. In terms of comparisons, acceleration in the Eclipse Cross is actually a little bit more similar to the average subcompact crossover than many of the compact crossovers with which this competes. The Volkswagen Tiguan will do the same thing in about 7.7, .7, and even Mazda's CX-5, which is not terribly swift in this segment, will do it in 8.1, although this is a little bit faster than the Rogue Sport, which will take 9.5 seconds to go 0 to 60. In our 60 to 0 braking test, it took 123 feet for this vehicle to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That is pretty average for this segment. It is about 10 feet longer, however, than Honda's CRV. But I think the biggest disappointment out on the road is the handling in the Eclipse Cross. Handling is somewhat average in this segment, even though this is styled to be the sporty entry. When it comes to overall actual grip, I'm going to give this a B-, minus, but I'm actually going to have to drop the score a little bit further for our complete score because the steering is just not engaging either. The steering actually feels a little bit twitchy. It's a little bit difficult to tell exactly where the vehicle is pointing. As a result, I find myself constantly correcting as we're going around the corners, and that's not something that you see in most of the entries in this segment. In terms of actual lateral grip, there are definitely models in this segment that are better than the Eclipse Cross. The Sportage with its 2.0-liter turbo engine, for instance, top-end versions of the Mazda CX-5, those will definitely handle better than this out on the road. And actually, Honda CRV does incredibly well also. That's because the latest version of the CRV really has turned over a new leaf and is sportier than it ever has been before, both in terms of acceleration and in terms of handling ability. Now, it is worth noting that one of the things that is likely hampering the handling ability of the Eclipse Cross is the high ground clearance that we find in this vehicle. This is among the best in the compact segment. When it comes to our ride score, this gets a C plus, and that's because we definitely feel all the minor imperfections on this road surface. I'm not sure if you can tell on the camera, especially the one looking at my face here, it's definitely jiggling around a lot, and we don't see that in the competition. I expected the Eclipse Cross to be a little bit softer than it is, Vehicles with higher ground clearances generally tend to be a little softer sprung, and that's not what we see necessarily in this vehicle. Cabin noise is also pretty average in this vehicle. We scored 73 decibels at 50 miles an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and give this a B when it comes to our overall cabin noise score. The one area where the Eclipse Cross excelled for us during our week was actually a little bit surprising, and that is fuel economy. We've actually been averaging about 30 miles per gallon overall in this vehicle, even though we've been driving this in our usual mixed driving cycle where we go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass twice every day. I suspect that this fuel economy display might be just a little bit optimistic, but even when we verified that fuel economy score by filling the vehicle up, driving it along, and then refilling it, we still ended up right around 29 miles per gallon. And that method of fuel economy calculation is actually a little bit more prone to error, so I suspect that this really is getting around 29 or 29 and a half miles per gallon. That actually is quite good for this segment. You can definitely thank the continuously variable transmission and the 1.5 liter turbo for that high fuel economy score. Now obviously your fuel economy will vary. I don't spend a great deal of time in stop and go traffic in our driving test cycle, 
but generally speaking, going up and over that mountain pass ends up making most vehicles come right around the EPA combined score. But again, this did improve on that. So if you're doing a lot of steady state highway driving, then this is likely going to be delivering better than the EPA combined average. But I suspect if you're doing a lot of city driving, then you will probably drop down there closer to the EPA average. Overall, this Mitsubishi comes across as a thoroughly competent vehicle in this segment, but it doesn't really excel in any particular area. For a vehicle that has such sporty styling, it's not the best handling entry in the segment. It's certainly not the fastest. It doesn't ride the best. The cabin isn't the quietest. And even though fuel economy is very good, it's not class leading. There are options that are going to be better than this. As we dive into pricing, it's important to keep two things in mind. First off, the Eclipse Cross is sort of a tweener. It is aligned with the RAV4 and CRV, but size-wise, it actually isn't that far off on the inside from the CHR and HRV. It's also important to keep in mind that the Eclipse Cross is definitely a style-forward vehicle. There's some compromises on the inside for the style that we have on the outside. Pricing starts at $23,295 for the base front-wheel drive model for 2018. Adding all-wheel drive will bring you up to $23,895, and all-wheel drive is standard on all the other trims. The base model is fairly well configured. We have that automatic transmission, fog lamps, alloy wheels, and a 7-inch infotainment system that we don't find standard on all the competition. We also have a single-zone automatic climate control system. On the other hand, if you want to move up to some of the other luxury features that we find in most mid-level trims of the competition, you won't find those in the LE trim. You have to step up to the SE trim, which is $26,395. If you want the latest in active safety technologies like autonomous braking and radar adaptive cruise control, you won't find those until you move up into the SEL trim and then add the Touring package. That means it is going to be considerably more expensive to get those features in the Eclipse Cross than the least expensive trim that has those features in something like the CRV or the Toyota RAV4. Compared against the Honda CRV, the Eclipse Cross is about $1,000 less than the base Honda. And if you look at the SEL trim, the difference actually gets a little bit larger. It's going to be about $3,000 less expensive versus an EXL trim of the Honda. The most appropriate comparison for the top end trim of the Eclipse Cross, I think, really is that EXL trim. I think the two ring is just a little bit beyond that in terms of overall feature content. Now on the downside, when it starts coming to value, those active safety technologies I just talked about, again, are not standard on the Eclipse Cross. So when you actually look at comparably equipped vehicles, the CRV really is not that far off the Mitsubishi when we're talking about MSRP. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we wrap things up at the end of the video. When you start crunching the numbers, value becomes just a little bit of a problem for the Mitsubishi. Because if you were to fully equip your Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross with all of those active safety gadgets and gizmos, you'd end up over $30,000. And that's not much of a discount versus the EXL anymore, and within easy reach of the $32,750 CRV Touring. Now keep in mind this is still a value-oriented segment, so the Mitsubishi is still going to cost you about 9 to 10% less, but you are still going to be getting less in that model than you would in that top-end CRV. Moving along to the Toyota RAV4, the RAV4 again starts higher, but it has Toyota's active safety technology standard on all trims, so all models get radar adaptive cruise control with their autonomous braking system. Like the CRV, top-end trims of the RAV4 will cost you more, about $3,000 more than the Eclipse Cross, but you get a bigger crossover, like we also see in the CRV, with a more accommodating back seat and definitely a bigger cargo area. Despite the sporty aspirations of the Eclipse, it's also not really a corner carver when compared to the RAV4, or actually the CRV that we just talked about. The Eclipse Cross definitely looks the part on the outside, but overall driving dynamics just left me wanting a little bit. Adding more fuel to this fire, the RAV4 is likely going to be seeing significant discounts towards the end of this calendar year. That's because there's an all-new RAV4 coming up very soon. And the new RAV4 is definitely going for better styling rather than the more anonymous styling that we see in the current model. I really think the new one looks attractive. And Toyota's also focusing on driving dynamics. They're actually going to be putting a torque vectoring rear axle in the RAV4 optional, and it's going to be the only one in this segment that has that feature. So I expect it to handle a little bit more like an Acura than any of the other entries in this segment. Toyota's also again doubling down on their active safety gadgets because it's going to have the next generation of their safety systems standard in that model, and it's going to finally have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So I expect that's going to be an incredibly good value in this segment, although we haven't driven it yet, but do keep that in mind. Now on the flip side, the current generation RAV4 is likely going to be sold at a significant discount, so it's going to close that gap between it and the Mitsubishi. Next up, we have the best-selling compact crossover in America, the Nissan Rogue. 
It's the best-selling model for a variety of reasons. It's well-priced, it's big, it's efficient, and it's very comfortable. It also is not too expensive. The base price is about $1,500 higher than the Eclipse, but you get Apple CarPlay, blind spot warning, autonomous braking, and a larger and more comfortable vehicle. Now, recently Nissan decided to stop offering the optional third row in the Rogue. Personally, I think that's a bummer because that really was a handy feature in that vehicle, but it has aligned it a little bit more with the average competitor in this group. Top end models of the Rogue will be about $2,500 to $3,000 more than the Mitsubishi, but you get more equipment in the Rogue and more interior space. Interestingly enough, we also get better fuel economy. Next up, we have the Mazda CX-5, which is also, I think, a style-forward compact crossover. The CX-5 certainly looks good, and in a way, like the Eclipse Cross, they've given up a little bit of interior practicality for those exterior good looks. But overall, it is still more accommodating than the Eclipse Cross, especially in the rear passenger area. The CX-5 is definitely the most engaging entry in this segment in terms of driving dynamics, and theoretically, that's where the Eclipse Cross should be. But it just doesn't end up there when you drive it. But on the flip side, the Eclipse is notably less expensive, especially in lower end trims versus the CX-5. And the CX-5 is definitely not the fastest entry in the segment. If you're looking for acceleration performance, you'll find that in the Honda CRV. But the CX-5 is an awful lot of fun to drive. I also think it is very, very attractive. Now on the downside, Mazda is a little bit behind when it comes to infotainment, and we don't find CarPlay or Android Auto in that cabin just yet. My bottom line with the Eclipse Cross is that comparisons are a tiny bit tricky. As I've said before, here at Alex and Autos, we talk about MSRP because we don't know what those discounts will be like in a month, six months, nine months, a year, etc. And you may be watching this a year after we filmed the car, so I really can't talk about dealer discounts especially. But the Mitsubishi is likely to sell at steeper discounts than the competition, so based on MSRPs, the Mitsubishi is just not as good of a value as I hoped it would be. And I don't think it's good enough of a value to start looking away from some of these mainstream options, like the CX-5, the new RAV4, the CRV, etc. But on the flip side, if you get a much larger discount at the Mitsubishi dealer than at the Toyota or the Honda dealer, then that value proposition does begin to change. Because if the Eclipse Cross had an extra $1,000 on the hood beyond what you're getting off of a CRV or a CX-5, then the Delta could open up to perhaps 20% less expensive. And at that point, I think the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross is definitely worth it. It's a style-forward vehicle, I like the way that it looks, and it is relatively comfortable up front. Now you're still going to have that more limited back seat, you're still going to have the smaller cargo area. Now it is important to keep in mind that we have been talking about compact crossovers, on the other hand, if you start taking a look at an HRV or a Kona, you're not going to find that much less room on the inside, and even though you'll have a better discount at the Mitsubishi dealer, those might actually be a better value for you. And that's why my top two picks in this segment would be the Mazda CX-5 or the Honda CRV. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And if you're looking in the segment below this and you're looking for a lot of room inside your vehicle, definitely put the Honda HRV on your shopping list. Again, let me know what you think about that down there. If you haven't already done so, click that subscribe button down at the bottom of your screen. Click on up there to the top of your screen so you can be taken on over to patreon.com to support this channel. Head over to facebook.com slash so you can see what I'm driving this week. And I'll talk to you later.